there's a strong union of DMD patients, families, and advocacy groups around the world. Together with physicians, scientists, and drug developers, we are proud to say we are within reach of finding new therapeutics and better care. Once these new therapies have been found and developed, what are the next steps in our DMD journey? Our next guests from academia and industry will share their knowledge with us about the biological complexity of DMD and current and future approaches to find innovative medicines that address this. So welcome to this webinar on Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. I'm Rick Saul and I am head of the Boston office. I'm a senior advisor for Wuji Abtech. And today's panel discussion will focus in on therapeutic approaches to Duchenne's uh, muscular dystrophy. Uh, DMD is a rare degenerative muscle disorder that results in muscle and heart failure. The genetic basis of the disease, which occurs in boys, arises from mutations of the gene responsible for the dystrophin uh, protein production, for which there are more than several thousand uh, mutations, giving rise to a defective dystrophin uh, protein. There's no known cures uh, for DMD, so treatments that are focused on improving muscle strength and functions with corticosteroids are in treatments for DMD patients with specific DNA variants uh, have allowed for a shorter usable dystrophin. With 79 exons, the dystrophin gene is considered one of the largest genes in the human genome. It's believed, believed that the exon skipping technologies may be applicable to 70, 60 to 80 percent of the Duchenne's uh, patients. With me today are some of the key innovators involved in creating novel therapies directed to Duchenne. Jane Lockendale is the Vice President of Clinical Sciences at PEPGEN. Rhonda basil Duby is Professor in the Department of Molecular Biology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Art Levin is the Chief Scientific Officer at Avidity Biosciences. Ash Duger is Senior Vice President and Head of Medical Affairs at Dime Therapeutics. And Stuart Peltz is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer at PTC Therapeutics. So what I'd like to do today is to start off our discussions uh, looking at uh, modalities, what that means for the patients, the drug development challenges uh, in the Duchenne area and rare diseases in, in, in general, assigning issues from the technical and drug development perspectives and the impact of collaborative, uh, collaborative approaches, uh, lessons learned and insights, and finally talk about some of the uh, prospects on the horizon. So when we... Uh, when we get uh, started, let's uh, discuss uh, modalities and therapeutics uh, first. And for that purpose, I'd like each of the panelists to describe first how, the, how transformative has, has the approved therapies been to date, where the gaps that exist, and how your technologies being, that are being pursued by your company or groups are addressing the, are addressing the shed. And so what I'd like to do is start with uh, Stu. Stu. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks, Richard. Appreciate uh, being here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so our company uh, has been working in Duchenne muscular dystrophy now probably over 20 years. And uh, the, we have two products in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. One product uh, is to um, uh, uh, trick the cell to produce dystrophin protein in a particular body of patients who have uh, a, a mutation called the nonsense mutation. Uh, and that's called Translarna. And then we have a second uh, drug that we're, uh, we, we're commercializing in the uh, United States, which is in FLASA, and that's a corticosteroid, because what happens is, you know, the, as, you, as you said, dystrophin, it's the loss of the dystrophin protein that results in, uh, in the disease. And the consequence of that is that uh, it's like a shock absorber. And so as muscles contract, uh, you, you could see breakage of the muscle, and that leads the constant loss of muscle, but also inflammation. So the, the translina, about 15% of patients have a, a nonsense mutation. And that's like a, a point alteration that leads to premature production of the protein and you don't have it. Translina tricks the cellular machine to allow the protein to read through and therefore to make a full length uh, protein. So uh, that's that, and that's that's being commercialized uh, around the globe outside of the United States. So we're 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 focusing on they're both orally bioavailable molecules. One is to treat a subset of patients uh, who have this particular mutation. The other is to treat the overall inflammatory uh, response that occurs as a consequence of, of of having 
muscle breakage. So those are the two products that we work on. They're both orally bioavailable. So you take it as a, as a, a pill or powder uh, and you take it orally and again, it's systemically given. Uh, would you like to go next? Sure. So many of the therapeutics are, are sorry, another therapeutic approach which is being taken in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the exon skipping approach. And um, much like Stewart's approach, you're, you're trying to trick the cell or, or, or trick the, the molecular machinery in the cell to produce a shorter version of the dystrophin protein that where you skip over a, a, a particular exon that, that may have a mutation in it. And, and existing therapies exist that use that mechanism, but the shortfall of those therapies and, and the reason that we, we, we are all here today is that those, it is difficult to get oligonucleotide therapeutics into muscle cells where they're needed for this disease. And what we've done at Avidity is we've taken an approach where we're using monoclonal antibodies to a cell surface protein that have been conjugated with an oligonucleotide specifically designed to skip specific exons in for particular subsets of boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and use, the, use that conjugate in order to facilitate the delivery of that oligonucleotide therapeutic into the cells. Now this overcomes some of the barriers that have been developed, have, have we've evolved with over the eons. And that is cells have, have evolved over eons not to take up foreign oligonucleotides. So you needed to come up with a molecular mechanism that allowed the cell to take up the oligo. And we're using monoclonal antibodies for that. Without that kind of approach, if you're not going to use a conjugate approach, it turns out that, that some of the oligonucleotides that are being used um, in, in therapeutic applications today have relatively poor pharmacokinetics. So if you can improve the pharmacokinetics, increase the amount, and then use receptor-mediated uptake to deliver the oligonucleotide to the cells where it's needed, you can actually create um, huge leaps in the potency of, of drugs that are um, pretty much on the market today, but have the ability to be even more potent if we can, if we can figure out a way to, to, to deliver them. So it's, it's really taking an, an approach that, that addresses some of the delivery issues and really addresses eons worth of evolution where we've evolved cell or cells have evolved to prevent oligonucleotide in general, foreign oligonucleotides entering in cells. Well, thanks very much. Uh, Jane, could you tell us what, what's going on at PepGen and your approach? Absolutely, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel. So our approach at PepGen is somewhat similar to what Art has just been talking about, because we also are looking at exon skipping therapies and oligonucleotides to attempt to address some of this, um, some of the patient people with Duchenne and specific mutations. Um, the difference between our approach and what, and what they're doing at Avidity and Dyan is instead of using an antibody or a fragment of an antibody to solve that issue of delivering oligonucleotides, we're using a peptide, so a small piece of protein that, help, um, that helps the oligonucleotide get across the cell membranes into the tissues of interest. We have a great deal of data showing we can get into muscle tissue, cardiac tissue, smooth muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, and indeed a number of other tissues as well with what we've been developing. Our um, platform is really based on a huge amount of work that was done at the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge over, over long periods of time where they identified these peptides quite a long time ago before the, the first exon skipping drugs were approved. But they did a great job of getting things in, but unfortunately they were toxic and this is not a great thing if you're a patient. They've, we've, a vast amount of work and med medical chemistry has gone on and now we have peptides that are both safe and very effective at getting drugs into cells, particularly muscle cells. And that's what, um, what we're, we're working on. I think Art has said everything that needs to be said about the issue of delivery of oligonucleotides. These are incredibly potent therapies, but if you can't get them to where they work, they will not be as incredibly effective as we'd like them to be. And I think on this panel, we have several different approaches to how to solve that problem of delivery. Well, Ash, how's, uh, how's your approach of dying differentiated from that? Yeah, you know, um, thank you again for inviting me to this great panel. Uh, I'm really excited about being here. Um, so, you know, I'll just emphasize one one thing that uh, both Art and, and Jane talked about first, that, that current exon skipping therapies, you know, they're limited. And, and one of the limitations that is clear is their ability to get into, uh, into uh, certainly 
uh, skeletal muscle uh, in enough levels to create robust exon skipping and dystrophin production. Um, but even penetration into uh, cardiac tissue and diaphragm has been really limited with current therapies, um, although they definitely provide benefit to, to patients. But I think we all agree that delivery of, uh, of exon skipping therapies to muscle is an absolutely key issue that um, we all are trying to solve in different ways. So, you know, at Dyne, we have uh, something called a, a force platform. It essentially consists of three parts. One is uh, a proprietary FAB antibody. So um, we use um, an antigen binding fragment or a piece of the monoclonal antibody that has a high affinity for something called a TFR1 receptor. It's a transferrin receptor that's highly expressed across uh, muscle cells, skeletal, uh, cardiac, and, and smooth muscle. And so uh, with this high affinity binding to the TFR1 receptor, um, we're able to also make sure that we're linking uh, our FAB to our exon skipping PMO to be able to drive um, the, uh, the, uh, the therapeutic payload, the PMO, into the, uh, the muscle cells uh, so that we can generate robust skipping and dystrophin production, and hopefully with limited, you know, off-target effects. So, um, you know, we're all trying to solve, you know, a similar problem here, uh, and it's great to see different technologies attempting to, to do so. Terrific. Now, earlier uh, is 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 a, a work going on at UT Southwestern, Rhonda. Maybe you can talk about some of the exciting work that's coming up from there. Yes. Again, I want to thank you, Richard, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, as you mentioned, I am working at an academic university, and we are taking a different approach from that which you have heard from the other panelists. We're actually going into the blueprint, into the genome, into the DNA, and modifying the actual mutation that in the dystrophin gene that causes the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we are using uh, CRISPR, which is a gene editing tool that was first originally found in actually bacteria and now has been engineered to use in human cells. Um, and so we are using that technology to correct the mutation and restore dystrophin expression as well as dystrophin function. So that's the approach we are taking. Now, now for each of your technologies, I would imagine there's uh, a number of outstanding issues, technical issues that still have to be overcome. Maybe uh, uh, start with uh, Art, maybe you can talk about some of those uh, issues and then I'll let, let the floor be open. Thanks. So Steph, again, again, the, the key issue is, is, is delivery. Yeah. And um, we're, we're actually very close to starting some of our first clinical trials with another oligonucleotide therapeutic for another rare skeletal muscle disease, um, where we will learn whether or not using the transferrin receptor in humans allows for uptake into, into patient cells. So again, we're very close to being able to check off a box with respect to the delivery issue using this monoclonal antibody as a delivery mechanism. And then from there, we will immediately shift gears and begin our work in, in looking at exon 44, uh, amenable skipping um, in, in DMD. So again, the delivery issue remains the, the, the issue of um, key critical importance. And hopefully in the very near future, as we're just about to kick off clinical trials with another transferrin mediated uptake in, in a muscle disorder, um, excuse me, myotonic dystrophy type one, we will um, at least have a basis at this point in time for where we can leap off as we begin our programs in DMD. So talking about challenges, I echo what Art said. Uh, the delivery, even with the CRISPR, CRISPR components, we face the same challenge in terms of delivery. We have chosen right now to use um, AAV, adeno-associated virus, to deliver the CRISPR components and we're also playing around with some uh, lipid nanoparticles, but you can imagine the task of getting uh, these particles in all the muscle. So right now viruses seem the best way for us to go, but it is a challenge, I agree. And you know, like many of us uh, at, at different companies and, and institutions, um, you know, we're, we're doing as much as we can to learn about um, our, our, you know, our technologies. And so uh, in order for us to be able to get to a place where we can have trials and patients, 
Uh, there's a tremendous amount of work we've done in, uh, in uh, relevant uh, non-clinical models to help us understand how to optimize the delivery, um, you know, to help us continue to understand you know, the right dose and dose frequency for, for our products. And so you know, at Dyne, we've done a lot of work in uh, sort of the traditional MDX mouse model uh, to look at uh, exon skipping, dystrophin, uh, product, uh, dystrophin production function, uh, as well as safety. And then of course, we're doing uh, studies in, in uh, non-human primates where you can look at uh, you know, exposure and safety and skipping. You can't look at dystrophin, but you, know, you can look at exon skipping. So you know, to be able to understand the, the, the technical limitations and to understand how best to enter into trials uh, you know, we're doing a lot of non-clinical work and at Dyne, you know, we're, we're close to getting into the clinic for 51 skip amenable patients. And then we'll follow it on with other, um, uh, patients with other, other mutations. And, um, and it, it, it applies to other disease areas like myotonic dystrophy or FSHD. So we're really excited about the technology and we learn from one program to another, you know, everything builds upon itself, which is really important. You continue to learn about what your technology can do what its limitations are, the safety. And so it's really important to accumulate learning uh, across different models and across different therapeutic areas. Yeah, and to add to that, Ash, I think in addition to learning about each of our own molecules, which are being delivered in different ways and have different toxicities, so we all have to do that work independently, there's so much we can learn communally as a field. Uh, where are those oligos going once we deliver them? Are they getting into the cytoplasm? Are they getting into the nucleus? Where will they work best? How long do they last? Are there, are there long-term consequences of having them in there? And as a community, as the science evolves, we're all learning so much more there. But then even more yet into the clinic, there are going to be more challenges of just the variable population and the changes in natural history and the differences in natural history between one group of patients and another and people with one mutation and another. So there is... There are so many challenges in developing therapies for Duchenne. We've come so far in the last 20 years, but I think we're, we're making some real strides to understanding these diseases, understanding these modalities, and really being able to drive forward effective um, therapies for patients. Hey, you bring up an interesting uh, point, uh, uh, Jay, with respect to uh, data, data sharing, for example, especially in a, in a way that it becomes uh, 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 take, taking not, uh, the confidential information, making it non-confidential in a way such that the community can learn. Could people comment on, on aspects of that? Yeah, we've done a lot. Um, I think people have actually been, uh, there, there's been a lot of data sharing and in particular, because if you think about Duchenne, while it's, it's considered a relatively large ultra-orphan disease, it's really a small patient uh, population overall. And the, the most valuable, kind of data you can have is, is, in, is the placebo clinical trial data from companies because they're extremely well done trials. They're, you know, the data is clean and it's good. And, it, it, and, and, and what, so what the groups have been doing is uh, we've been able to actually bring together, like we've done two phase three trials. Lily has done the trial. BioMarin has done trial, and we've actually aggregated a lot of that uh, placebo-controlled trial, which is incredibly valuable data that then allows you to mine information to try and define what is the best clinical endpoints that were on the trial. But it's not only the like like Jane was saying; it's not only what are, what are, in a sense when you say what are the best clinical endpoints, what is the least, which ones are the least variable, right? Um, and, and, and what is the variability that will ultimately allow you to power the power the clinical trial as a consequence of that? But it's even more than that. It's also like, um, I think most neurodegenerative diseases are sort of Goldilocks. When the patients are, they're almost like, when they're early in the stage, they're very good and you don't see big changes. And when they're late in the disease, they go rapidly and you can't, you most modalities won't have a real effect because like let's say if you're looking at loss of angulation or you're looking at changes they're going to rapidly go you need sort of like in the middle where there's some decline that's measurable but it's not so rapid that you can't that the modality won't do anything about that uh, affect the ultimate outcome and that takes a very much amount of work to try and figure out what's the best patient population on top of what's the best outcome measures to be able to demonstrate that. 
And you needed all of that data to be able to do some of that. And so there's been a lot of mining as a consequence of that. And I think there's a lot of ways where we can use, uh, where, where it has been used and we've used it ourselves as a consequence to be able to pick out what are the best patients, what's the best outcome measures to, in order to uh, have the greatest chance of success that if you have a drug that works, that you'll be able to see it, right? That's the hardest part in some of these diseases because in the time frame that you're doing the experiment in. And the points you're raising, Stuart, also suggests that, that this is a place where biomarkers can become important and, and having the right biomarkers. And that's this is really a place where we're going to share with academia because, we're, because many of these biomarkers are going to be assessed in academic environment. It's a place where where we may be able to actually for the first time modulate some of those biomarkers as we develop them. And yes, you know, this is a bit of look, a forward looking statement. We do need to develop biomarkers. We, we, we need them and we need them validated. But I think ultimately um, as, as, as much as we can move away from um, these highly variable endpoints that we're dependent upon today and, and have much more quantitative measurements of the molecular changes and how they relate to physiology and to, and to the to the phenotype, I think that's when we're going to make even even greater strides in the in design and interpretation of clinical trials. You know, I, I guess I am, I am a little bit um, Pollyanna-ish here. I, I admit that I'm being incredibly <laughs> optimistic and forward-looking, but I think this is where this is this is where we should this is where we should strive to be in the very near future with many of these diseases. It is good. If Ash is Pollyanna-ish, I, I, I am probably even more so, but one of the things we've really seen in the Duchenne community, which I think is amazing, and Stu alluded to this, is the generosity of people who've done trials, sharing that data, either through the Duchenne Regulatory um, Science Consortium that I used to run, or through the Collaborative, collaborative Trajectory Analysis Program, bringing that data together, sharing that data, sharing analyses, working in collaboration with the regulators in the case of de-risk of really being able to drive ahead of analyses that support biomarkers and support endpoints and help us understand that variability in the population. I think the ability of this community to both share data, work together and drive some of these analyses forward. We're not there yet. You're absolutely right, Art. We don't have all the biomarkers we need. And there are a lot of half-developed or semi-developed biomarkers that have huge promise. But if we can continue to share data and work together, we can move all of this forward a whole lot more quickly. Now, I'm sure that makes me sound even more Pollyanna-ish. I've been sitting in the seat of trying to drive these collaborations for years. But I think it's really important to moving all of our therapies forward and getting them to patients as quickly as possible. I would just add, you know, seeing the amazing work that, you know, Jane did at CPAP has moved the field forward. I mean, it's it's been tremendous what, what um, many of these uh, collaborations and consortiums have done. And I would just add, so not only does it help companies um, develop trials that are, that are smarter, that will truly extract the treatment effect of the modalities we're testing, but similarly, it, you know, many of these collaborations and databases help us contextualize the data that we, you know, that we actually, um, you know, uh, generate from our trials. So whether it's, you know, from the Synergy database, or if it's imaging DMD, which has tremendous, you know, muscle MRI data uh, across the population. So, so these collaborations are so important uh, to be able to also understand, are you able to change the nature of the disease, the trajectory of the disease? Um, and, and there's a tremendous amount that exists to help us understand whether it's North Star UK, Synergy, Imaging DMD, CTAP. Um, so there's, there's uh, you know, the, the, the field has moved uh, incredibly uh, over the last few years, over the last several years, thanks to, you know, these efforts like Jane is alluding to and that she's led in the past. And, and I might I'll, add, can I add yeah, something? Yeah. So yeah. in terms of coming from an academic perspective, I mean, for us, you know, we go to meetings and we really enjoy sharing our new data with everybody. But what I see in the DMD field is that there is a collaboration between companies and academia in ways that I've never seen with any of my other research efforts. And added on top of that are the the parents and, and the advocacy groups who really play a big role in getting the uh, industry and academia together at a lot of the meetings that they organize. So I, I think that in terms of collaboration, I think I haven't seen anything like that before. So the DMD world is really unique.
in that aspect. Yeah. So we'll come back to about patient advocacy groups in just a moment. But I just want to finish up our conversation around drug development challenges. And do we have regulatory approval? Do we have regulatory buy-in to all these to all the biomarkers and uh, all the all the markers that that's, uh, that you're generating uh, as 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 your endpoints. Uh, so our yeah. friends friends at the regulatory agencies are obviously and clearly uh, defined by data. So I, I, um, do we have all the support from all the re worldwide regulatory agencies on all of these? Absolutely not. And that's probably reflected by the data we have available, that we have some support for all of them. We do not have definitive proof that any of any of the biomarkers we have, including those that have been used for accelerated endpoints, will really change disease. It's a good hypothesis. We have some data, things like MRI, as Ash was mentioning too earlier, we actually have quite a lot of data. Um, and the regulators are following the science just as well as, as, as much in detail as we are trying to understand how these biomarkers reflect clinical endpoints, how they reflect patient experience, which may be another thing entirely. We're all following this. The regulators are all following this. Um, I think we're in it together and we're all trying to understand this disease at the same time in real time while we're developing drugs for it. I'm sure my colleagues have more to say about that. Yeah, let, me amplify, let me amplify what, what Jane just said, and that is, the regulatory authorities are extraordinarily interested. They understand that these are terrible diseases that we're dealing with, and they have really done their best to facilitate and, and create collaborations with, with the corporate interests, um, not necessarily the corporate interests, with the interests of the patients in mind, and to create, create what is an environment where it is more of a give and take, the agencies will provide information, what their information as to what they're going to need in order to, to really feel convinced. And I think making sure that we keep the regulatory groups involved as we develop these drugs is extraordinarily important for us and view them rather <laughs> like I did in my youth as antagonists, um, they are now really partners for us. And so between the academic collaborations, the collaborations we have, um, with, with, the, with the patient advocacy groups and the regulatory authorities. I mean, I think all of, all of these are key, key parameters that we need to keep in mind as we're developing these drugs. And really, although we think of them as regulatory hurdles, it's really convincing the regulators and convincing the, the, the public at large that we have therapeutics that work and that are safe. And that's, that's really the goal. The goal is to get the drugs to the patients as quickly as we can, and I think the regulators share that. Yes, you know, I think the, um, I think that that's all true. I think everyone's working on the same side. the The tricky part of biomarkers are is that they're supposed to reasonably predict clinical benefit, right? And so that's always been so, th and that's what everyone's working towards. But it's almost like a chicken and egg problem in some ways, right? Where how do you know something shows clinical benefit when you're measuring a biomarker, and so. It's always difficult. Like, I think a great example is in the spinal muscular atrophy field, right? It's the reduction of SMN protein that leads to, to that disease. And so most recently we've done trials where we done using a, a small molecule drug where you see increased levels as a biomarker in the blood. And then you saw improvement in terms of clinical benefits. So you've linked the biomarker to the clinical outcome or manifestation of that, right? And so that's a clear marker now. Other people can use SMN. Levels. So it's, it's actually a nice. So the difficulty in a lot of the neurodegenerative diseases that we've had so far is that connection has not been easy, right? Uh, the, and that's in part because we don't have great clinical markers and we don't have great biomarkers and where we've been able yet to connect that. And so what the, what the field needs to do is to work hard to try and get that. And so it's, and, and it's variable in terms of what the regulators think. Like if you think that the US has, uh, for better or for worse, have now used dystrophin as a biomarker, that's an, an approval point for accelerated approval, where you then have to show clinical benefit. The rest of the community outside of the US has not yet uh, taken that up as a viable approach for approving drugs yet. So you need to do clinical benefit. So it's a little bit all over the place in terms of how you can use biomarkers versus clinical endpoints. Thank you. Know, I, would, I would just yeah. uh, add a little bit, not, not too much more to add. I mean, you know, in my experience, the, 
the, the regulatory bodies, um, certainly in the US and Europe, they, they've been very supportive. I mean, they welcome um, the dialogue. They want to help uh, make sure that the industry, industry is conducting trials that will help them understand the benefit risk of a product. Um, yes, we have the accelerated approval pathway in the US and, and there's not something like that that exists in, in Europe for Duchenne yet. Um, but, but nevertheless, uh, ex-US regulatory authorities are still very open to dialogue about how, how to get these therapies to market. And it does come down to data. It does come down to, to benefit risk uh, as, it, as it always has. And so, um, you know, I just find, I, and, and, they, and, and they are personally invested in the, in the sense of, um, you know, the FDA members sitting down with CPAP. And, and, and trying to help guide CPATH and have a dialogue with CPATH or other, other bodies. And so there is a tremendous amount of passion and support from regulators for, uh, you know, for, for Duchenne, for district myopathies, for other diseases, of course. Um, and so it's been, really, um, it's been really gratifying to see that grow over time. Thank you. Now, uh, one, one last uh, topic on the area of uh, challenges in drug development is that of uh, manufacturing. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Sue's experiences have been in the small molecule space for sure. Uh, but as we get to these more complex, uh, let's say biologically driven mechanisms, uh, do we have manufacturing issues that we're gonna have to contend with? Maybe uh, uh, if anyone would tackle that question, I'd be very excited. Sure, I, I, can, I can kick it off. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the advantages that, that we have with the current technologies that, that we're using is that we're building on multiple decades of experience synthesizing monoclonal antibodies. And we're, we're, we're taking advantage of now decades of experience making oligonucleotides like the PMOs or, or some of the sRNAs that we're using from others. So, so we're taking two relatively well-known technologies and, and the known safety profiles of those technologies and, and building upon that. So again, the, the, the manufacturing issues, while they are not small, at least for the technology that, that we're proposing, these are technologies that have been well established and, and, and well utilized in the pharmaceutical industry up, up till now. So again, we've tried to minimize the technologic risk and the manufacturing risk by using well trodden pathways of oligonucleotide therapeutics and prolanged monoclonal antibodies. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's okay. not, I, I, I would just say, yeah, just a quick comment, not, not much yet. It's, 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 it's um it's non it's not um, a trivial matter to produce um, you know in, in our case a a fab drug conjugate um, but to Art's point the technologies existed um, and we really need to be um, uh, efficient in being able to uh, manufacture uh, these compounds and I think you know it's that efficiency that you continue to optimize and optimize have greater yields. Um, but it is, it is, you know, there is technology that's existed uh, for us to be able to uh, lean on uh, to gain, to have that confidence that we can uh, manufacture safe drugs with, uh, you know, with uh, enough efficiency. And so, we're, you know, it, there's a lot that we can lean on from from previous learnings, which is which is important. So let's take the other, the other the other one that's a little more tricky is in the gene therapy manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That one is first of all, it's it's um, the quantities required are relatively large. The manufacturing is actually difficult. Uh, the regulatory environment is changing over time as more and more of them come through. And so that right now, that, but, but that, that's somewhat because it's a nascent field in terms of real treatments that the manufacturing of that is both um, being sort of defined more but that's, that is something that, well, uh, uh, there's no one represented here on the gene therapy is something that everyone is, is looking at and the difficulties of, man we do do gene therapy at our company. And so we have a manufacturing facility. So I'm really quite aware of just the difficulties of, of, of manufacturing large quantities of that material, but that will approve over time as well. Right. So that, that kind of led me, was going to lead me into my next question is where does gene therapy fit in this whole, you know, all the therapeutic uh, regimens that we have or optionalities that we have or will have, hopefully going forward to the uh, treatment of the shines? 
I think it's got a huge amount of promise in the future. And we're in early days of gene therapy. The first gene therapy has been in the clinic for a little while now. And the concept of being able to replace a missing protein is intuitively fabulous, rather, rather like Rhonda's approach of being able to fix the gene in place is fabulous. But as Stu just said, this is relatively early stage technology and there's still a lot we need to learn about gene therapies. I think what's exciting is the, the potential to um, have a whole pharmacy of different drugs that depending what stage of disease you are, what mutation you have, what your risk um, tolerance is, you might be able to choose from all of these different modalities and having a deep pipeline in Duchenne and Rhonda working CRISPR. I'm sure you have thoughts about the other gene therapies as well. Right. So, I mean, the gene therapy, I think that you're speaking about is putting in a really truncated microdystrophin in, and in terms of its function, there's so many questions about it. So the, the type of you know, uh, gene editing that we're doing is to, again, make these little RNA, these guide RNAs, which tell the CRISPR where to act, go in and make the modification so that the gene is repaired in such a way that you'll be then making some dystrophin, albeit it might be also a truncated form, but not to the same extent of truncation as they have with the microdystrophin. So it is, you know, working on those guides to make sure that you tell the CRISPR where to go in the genome, that is key, and then delivering it. Um, so those are the two areas that are under heavy, uh, you know, um, experimental design right now. The, the issues that we have with, uh, with uh, delivering the, uh, the gene therapy is really based on viral load issues, right, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, when it, well like the, they're on to the 10 to the 14th per kilogram of patient type loads, which are relatively large, no, large loads. And the reason is, is people are trying to get to all muscles within the cell. So that, you know, the, and, the, and, the, and that's sort of been one of the major features is because they're, somehow you need to tolerate the, the kids in order to be able to put that sufficient amount into them. And that's been their biggest issues in terms of when you've seen uh, trials go on hold was often because of the consequence of, of that. So, but that just, I think that's a matter of needing, being more efficient and, and knowing how A, to target better and also, um, uh, be able to, and therefore be able to use less viral loads as a consequence of that. There's going to be room for lots of different modalities. Yes. And, and all of these modalities should be complementary. And that you, you may at one stage of a patient's journey want to use gene therapy, other, other places you want to use pharmacologic interventions, other places you want to use small molecule pharmacologic interventions. So I think. We, we, we tend to think in terms of competition, but in reality, these are choices that, that, the, that the patients will have in, in the future, and that, that, these, that these choices may actually ultimately lead to better overall improvement as we can manage this disease over, over, its, over its, its natural history, and that's really one of the key. I think there's, you know, there's companies that are investing in understanding uh, how, how the uh, and academic institutions and how these modalities fit together, uh, how an exon skipping modality uh, can fit together either sequentially before or after or in combination with a gene transfer therapy. Um, and, and, you know, I think we all hope and, and I certainly expect that there's going to be um, sort of a, a number of choices for, for patients and families. So if, if, if someone has a pre-existing antibody pre-existing antibodies to the, to the vector. Well, you know, there will be a number of other choices, hopefully, for that patient. Um, if, you know, if redosing isn't possible for a few years, right? Or, or it, it just may make sense to give exon skipping drugs, you know, chronically and, and apply a gene therapy. So there's a lot of investment, a lot of research going on. And, and I can't wait to have this, you know, same panel conversation, you know, uh, soon, you know, next year or the year after. And, and, uh, and kind of see where we're at with our crystal balls. Uh, Ron, we're, we're, spending time, we're spending time also trying to figure out how to use less virus and like increasing the amount of uh, RNA, the guide RNA that's being made is one of the tricks that we see with our preclinical studies that makes a big difference and you're able to come down in the viral load. Well, the so, other thing also is, is there, that the polypharmacies could be required not only because of trying to the precision medicine that we're talking about here, but 
you have to reduce inflammation in order to get many of these things to work. In the absence of that, it, you know, you know, regulations, transcription, protein synthesis are far lower in the, in cells that are where there's an inflammatory milieu. There's right. also the notion of you know, as kids get older, and really, you know, if you think about it, but by seven years old, they're somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the muscle is gone. You need to have uh, muscle regeneration. There might be ways in which uh, drugs or other ways where we induce muscle growth. So there's so on top of getting precision medicine on bringing dystrophin in, we're going to need to get rid of the inflammation and increase growth of muscle cells. So that's where you can see that, you know, uh, that, and no one drug will necessarily do all of that, right? A precision medicine isn't getting rid of inflammation. It's not also causing increased, increased muscle growth. And so that it's good, you know, you think about almost like oncology, right? There's going to be multiple therapies depending what the needs are of each patient. And that could very much depend on the age in which you get to treat the patient as well. Right, I agree. I think one of the keys will be to treat early if you can. So you have diagnose early and then treat early. And the, the way we approach uh, this early treatment, I guess the principle might be different than what than, uh, simply going after dystrophin, for example. Uh, you know, there might be other, other, other uh, targets that we may be thinking of, right? If, uh, uh, besides dystrophin, if anyone, anyone would like to comment on that. Well, it's a monogenetic disorder. Right. So if you could replace the dystrophin, you have, no, but no, if you could also increase the concentration of eutrophin in cells versus dystrophin, right. you certainly, if there is a means to be able to do that, you could probably come up with another way, which is almost a gene replacement, uh, if you can turn on the transcription of, of eutrophin in cells. So there's other ways that you could do it, but dystrophin is a key yes. player right now. Right. I agree with Stuart. Okay. I, you know, I, this is a little off topic, but, you know, in terms of earlier diagnosis, you know, we really need to move towards newborn screening. Um, right. You know, it, it, it's, it's essential that we, we start to, as cross industry, cross government, um, you know, cross academia, push for newborn screening so that, you know, the average age of diagnosis, you know, which is like four or five in the U.S., we need to push away earlier. Um, we know that there are deficits that are being as early as two years of age. But you know, the, you know, muscle is being lost. Time, you know, uh, time is muscle. So to be able to treat as early as possible uh, with the most powerful medications is absolutely critical. And it's really newborn screening that's going to get us there. Uh, terrific. Well, let's just shift gears for a little while and talk about collaborations and patient advocacy. How important are these in terms of finding these new drugs and the new directions that we might undertake? Let's start with Jane. Sure, and um, as the panel know, knows, I have some bias having worked for and with patient advocacy for most uh, groups for most of my career. Um, I actually think it's absolutely critical that companies work with patient advocacy groups and with patients and their families all the way through. We need to understand the communities we're working for. We need to understand what they want from our therapies, how they can best tolerate clinical trials to get effective ther therapies that are useful to them, to those patients. And uh, patient advocacy groups are our partners through all of this. They are the neutral conveners that have pulled together so many of these pre-competitive space collaborations together, whether they're working on biomarkers or outcome measures or working with the regulators to understand the disease. Even at the academic level, as Rhonda mentioned earlier, convening meetings to bring academics and companies together, bringing clinicians into those groups and making the community as a whole communicate all the way through from basic discovery to bringing, bringing drugs on the market to patients. So way back when, when I was working at MDA and we worked with Stu and PTC on some of the very, very early studies, um, it was very clear that the company had something we could help them do it and it happened, at least it's, um, to, the, to the degree that we could with the technologies at the time. And mistakes were made along the way, we all make mistakes, but the community as a whole can do a lot more than any of us individually. And the patient advocacy groups are really the linchpins to pulling everyone together, to making sure the patient voice is heard, the companies know what they're doing for the right reasons and how, how we can all work together to make it happen as quickly as possible. And then I'll get off my soapbox and let my uh, let my fellow panelists who have seen it from the other side also talk. Well, I'd say you know as as Jane said, we we started in probably two thousand three or four, and we had a drug for a non-suspect patient that could be used 
and we had calculated at the time probably 2,500 diseases where, where, where about 15% of patients have their disease due to a non-sense mutation. And the interesting thing there is the, one of the, once we thought we had a drug, I walked around to many and, and found a lot of advocacy groups. And it was interesting to find like, the, you know, we started with Duchenne in part because they had their whole act together, uh, them and the CF Foundation at the time, where they, they were trying to get uh, physicians together. There was an animal model that you could study. Uh, they were interested in natural history. They were incredibly passionate about it. You can meet parents. And so in a way we started with the groups in two, for since 2004 or five. So we all, we actually grew up with them, right? And we grew and they, and, and they, and we learned from them. They learned from us of what it's like to bring a drug, you know, an idea into the clinic, into get, getting the patient. So it was, I thought it was a tremendous, and I really learned then. And it was great for the company too, because it transitioned the company to realizing the passion is the patient, not just the science, right? So when you're a little company at first, you're, it's all about the science. Then you go here and you meet everyone, you realize that if you could change the course of how their life is, that's a big deal. And you give them hope. And so there's a lot, you get a lot, but it, it's a two-way street. Not only are you trying to bring a drug to them, they're bringing, you're, they're bringing the passion and power and in a sense they give, give the company a cause. And I've always said, it's better to work for a cause than a company. And so everyone, everyone was, it, it, it was really powerful as a consequence. So we now work with hundreds of patient advocacy groups across and it's always valuable to us. Yeah, I would. I, not, uh, you know, so well said uh, by Jane and, and Stuart. I think they've been tremendous educators, you know, for us. Like, what what are we targeting? And and they've really been very clear in what we need to target. And so that has been a huge educational experience, I think, for, for many of us, certainly for me. Um, I, I also um, have have seen, right, their, you know, the advocacy organizations such as, you know, PPMD or QDShine investing in technologies, investing in technologies coming out of academia or investing in private companies and really putting uh, time and money and resources and effort and advice behind, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a number of technologies to be able to advance them and, and may the best technologies get out there and, and, and get drugs on the market. And it's been absolutely tremendous. And then, you know, for us internally, you know, we'll have pa we've had patient advisory boards and reached out to so many different patient leaders to gain advice in our, um, you know, our development program. And, and it's just, you know, we're, we're so, so grateful for that voice that they provide, you know, that, 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 um, that time and effort and thought they provide to be able to make sure that we are, you know, going down the right track and, and, and incorporating what, what they think is needed uh, in the clinical development program. So this has been a great set of discussion. We got down to the last couple of minutes. So I think I'd like to wrap up by saying, by asking the uh, panelists, what, what, would you, what, do you, what do you say to the, to the world uh, who are working either in Duchenne or outside Duchenne about, about the prospects of success? You know, what's around the corner for, 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 for this, for this uh, 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 disease and disorder? So let's start with Rhonda. Okay, great. I think the future is bright uh, for, for Duchenne. Um, and I believe so that CRISPR really offers them a new approach. You know, our you know, idea is a one and done. You go in there, you fix the mutation, and then um, you know, you're able to restore dystrophin. And, and I know that's a little bit of fantasy, but um, I believe that we'll be able to uh, overcome the challenge of delivery of the guides. We spend a lot of time working out the guides and making sure we have the right ones to go in and change the mutation and correct it. I believe we'll be able to partner with in, um, you know, different uh, like engineering team, production team to be able to get the CRISPR components into the muscle, into the heart cells, and hopefully also into brain and be able to correct the disease. And the key will be, as Ash said, early detection, and then we'll be able to deliver the components because once the muscle is 
atrophy, then you, we don't make muscle. All we do is if we can make the dystrophin, we can keep the muscle um, in functional. So I believe the future is very bright for Duchenne and CRISPR. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Stu, you're next on my, on my screen, so I'm going to go to you. I see through the lens of when we began for where we are now. We were like the first, and now I see a plethora of potential treatments in many different disorders. So, and I'm a, I'm a shots on guy, uh, shots on goal sort of guy. The more shots you have, the more likelihood there's going to be success. And I think, you know, people are thinking quite broadly in terms of, you know, fixing the inflammatory, fixing the dystrophin, fixing the regeneration, so that hopefully, you know, 10 years is not such a long time in drug discovery, but in that area, hopefully we're not that far off from saying we're treating uh, all aspects of the disease. Uh, that will be good, not only for DMD kids, but if we could get muscle, it'd be good for all of the neuromuscular disorders. So I, I'm hopeful that what comes out of here is gonna benefit the DMD kids, but also uh, will result in helping a broad set of uh, patients with different neuromuscular disorders. Thank you, Ash. Some closing thoughts. Yeah, uh, I think you know what I what I expect, what I hope and expect is similar. That that what you you know hopefully what folks here here are hearing here is um, many different institutions and companies looking to develop uh, treatments that are going to transform lives. We're going to change the nature of this. Uh, of the progression of Duchenne. It's, it's, it's not gonna be just slowing down progression, which is incredibly important, but hopefully stopping progression, addressing cardiopulmonary issues, maybe even reversing, who knows? But it's really you know um, incredible to see that with these technologies that we're talking about and others that aren't represented here, we're, you know, everybody's really aiming high and trying to transform uh, the, the, the treatments that are out there. Thank you, all right. So it's, it's, it's difficult to build on what was said, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. And, and that is, we're at the, we're at the cusp of, of the biological revolution. And you're hearing that we're going from modulating RNA, modulating RNA and, and how RNA is processed all the way to Rhonda, who's, who's actually going to alter, alter the genome. And I think we're, in the, we're really in the process of learning how to use all these tools in the best possible way, which is a bright brighter future for these boys. But I think the, the goal here is that we need to get therapies to these boys now because unfortunately 10 years in the life of a, of a, of a boy with, with DMD is a, is a long time. It's the difference between ambulation and, and non-ambulation. Right. So our, it's our goal is to really, you know, how can we best uh, harness the biological revolution that's going on now and get, get, get drugs to patients as quickly as possible and, and, and make a difference for the boys who are toddlers today, so that when they're teenagers or when they're older, they'll, they'll, they'll maintain ambulation and, and live a high, have a higher quality of life. Thank you, I like what you said. And Jane, final closing. Well, I certainly share the optimism of, of the other panelists that I think we're on the verge of huge changes. In the time I've been working in Duchenne, we went from really nothing to the first treatments reach, reaching patients, which are having some effect. And I think it's just moving faster and faster. There are more and more things in the pipeline, depending on who you are, your mutation, what stage you, you are in disease, you're, you're probably gonna need different therapies. In some cases, you may be more reliant on the anti-inflammatories and small molecules. Some, some people uh, may have exon skipping treatments sooner, but I think wherever you fit in that spectrum, there are going to be options for you soon. 10 years, as Stu says, is not as long in drug development as it sounds. It's a very long time in, the, in, the, um, in a patient's life. But I do believe we're gonna start having some options. We already have some options and we're gonna have more and they're coming faster all the time. Personalized medicine is changing things. It's been, been evolving more quickly than we can imagine. I couldn't have imagined CRISPR um, at the beginning of my career. And now we're actually talking about thinking about it as a potential treatment going into human beings. There is so much promise out there. And so long as we as a community continue to work together and develop all these different uh, elements and arms coming together, I think we're going to get there. I've been in nonprofits and I moved into industry because I, st I saw things that I think were really going to work. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that next 10 years looks like. Uh, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you, Art. Thanks, Ash, uh, Stu, and Rhonda. Thank you so very much for your participation today. And I want to thank all the, all the registrants who came uh, to the uh, 
for this panel discussion, uh, for your time and, and, and for the listening. Thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.